grace by God of having a great education that's allowed me to understand the dynamics of both uh, much of what various forms of Protestantism teach as well as what Roman Catholicism teaches and the Lord as well graciously led me into the full truth of Catholicism uh, and as a result of my ongoing journey. So uh, I am very honored uh, and pleased to be able to uh, conduct this course and be with you all today. This is session four. Uh, we've been, as you know, soldiering through, and that's how uh, even a you know slight word to use with Reformation, but we've been soldiering through this uh, period of time known as the Reformation. Uh, and in fact, what we've discovered is that we are finding that there are reformations, not a reformation. So we've already pretty well covered, although we're going to still deal with him a little bit today, Martin Luther. And now we're moving over to Switzerland and to Zwingli. And uh, we're going to be talking about, uh, but also Luther with this event known as the Peasant War. And then how this Peasant War would have a marked change on the face of Protestantism and how this outcome would really affect all of Europe and uh, you might say even establish that Protestantism was not going to be going any place. Um, not from a positive standpoint either, it was a pretty negative thing as we're going to find out this peasant revolt. Well, let's go back a little bit, we'll, we'll cover a little bit of what we covered last week with Zwingli. If you remember, I said that uh, he posted his equivalent of Martin Luther's 95 Theses in 1522. He did his equivalent, which was to actually reject the concept of fasting at Lent. And he had a sausage feast in the middle of Lent, uh, claimed that he had been instructed by the Holy Spirit to do this. And of course, the peasants who rarely even had sausages at all embraced this wholeheartedly, and it made his movement much more popular with the common people than Luther's movement was. Luther had a real popularity amongst the nobility. He had some peasants, but really nobility, the princes of Germany, they were the people who were much more in favor of what Martin Luther was proposing. Zwingli is going to have a much more of a popular appeal and a popular uprising, in particular disciples of Zwingli, who become even more radical than Zwingli himself does. Uh, and want to push for even greater social and political change than where Zwingli is, is really wanting to go to, are going to change the, the map of Europe to a certain degree as far as how politics, uh, economics, and religion are going to be understood throughout the European continent. And by the European continent, I'll even include England, although England, as we know, is pretty much separated as an island from the European continent by a body of water, by the English Channel. But in fact, England is going to have more information. This is going to be, we're going to talk about that a little bit today too, but it's going to be so completely different from what happens in Europe that it's almost, and not even almost, it is actually going to create war between uh, England and Europe uh, in many different venues and for a long, extended period of time all the way into our own and past our own American Revolution, you know, England and France are still at loggerheads all the way into the 19th century. Um, so Zwingli made individual Christian liberty in such manners as fasting, um, prayer, even the understanding of Eucharist we found Zwingli does not, does not share a sacramental view. He holds a memorial view of, of the communion, uh, which he tries to defend at the Augsburg Conference, which we're not going to quite get to today, but we might mention it once or twice. And I've mentioned it once or twice in the, in the past. But Augsburg was a, an attempt to bring all of the various forms of Protestantism together underneath one banner so they would have something of the uniformity that's lacking that we have in the Catholic faith. You know, anywhere you go, Catholics are going to believe the same thing. If you don't believe the same thing, guess what that means? You're not Catholic. <laughs> you know, you might call yourself Catholic, you may play Catholic, 
But if you're going to reject the papacy, if you're going to reject church councils, if you're going to reject the magisterium, if you're going to reject the catechism, if you're going to reject the teachings of the church, if you're going to embrace Protestant idealism, you're not Catholic. And even if you think you're more conservative than what the church is now, and you want to go back to some romanticized, you know, high Middle Ages church, you're not Catholic. Because frankly, the church has moved on. The church now is a church of the 21st century. It's not the church of the 15th century, except as the 21st century relates to the 15th century. But we can't romanticize. I'll talk with some people this weekend about this, and it's usually enough because when you talk to people that want to be very steeped in some Catholic tradition, we're talking about forms here, not substance. Forms, not substance. When they want to revert to uh, forms that really don't work well sometimes in the 21st century, you have to, I, I, I make the statement, I said, one thing we don't, and they have some valid objections, you know, the, the valid is that, you know, you want to be doing the same thing in every place all the time, right? And I, I, I see that, okay? And I say, that's a valid, you know, condition to raise. That's something we can look at and see how, how can we better assure a un uniformity of practice throughout the church worldwide. Maybe, maybe that does need to be addressed. But I said the greater fear is that we become Catholic Amish. If you know anything about the Amish, they're a Protestant sect. What they did is they romanticized an idealized 19th century pastoral society. So that, in fact, you know, they live in a world without telephones, without motor cars, without computers, without anything. And they want to pretend, you know, that two centuries of time didn't exist. Why do Catholics want to pretend that six centuries have not thus far existed? And it's like, stop. Stop. Because seriously, we have to be a growing church or what will we become? A dying church. It's really that simple. Now that doesn't mean we embrace every thing that comes out from underneath the sun, but it does mean that we take advantage of the opportunities that we have in the 21st century to better proclaim the gospel and to reach more people with the gospel. I mean, to me that just makes perfect sense. Computer, you know, we can condemn it all we want, oh, it's horrible, and social media is horrible, and, and you know, the whole thing, but frankly, it's not that that's horrible, it depends on how it's used. Is it being used for pornography and satanic purposes? Is it being used to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ? Is it being used as an instrument of bullying and of, and of harshness and, and of uh, harm to people? Or is it being used to pass along grace and peace and the message of love? That's the choice of the user. But to ignore the technology would be to ignore a great benefit that the church has to, to reach the world that is obsessed a lot of times, yes, with technology. And to ignore it would be more to our peril because we risk making ourselves irrelevant to a world which has the technology, correct? So, understand something about this. We say that Zwingli was following his own conscience here, it's just that Luther created this monster. And then Luther didn't really want the monster he created, and he didn't want any responsibility for the monster he created either. When Luther thought he was creating his brand of Protestantism, which would be based on, you know, the sola doctrines, the understanding that scripture alone stands by itself, uh, that Christ alone stands by himself, that grace alone stands by itself, that faith alone stands by itself. He meant, of course, as he himself interpreted these things. Enter. <laughs> no God release. It happens. And so consequently, Luther, uh, when he saw where his baby grew up to be, was in sex. As a matter of fact, Luther hated Zwingli with a passion. Hated him. And he hated the people under Zwingli even more. He was not fond of Henry of England either. Uh, him and Henry are going to have more than one little tip. Uh, Luther and Calvin are like cats and dogs in the same room. 
And this is going to be really brought out in this Augsburg conference that we talked about. This happened in the 1540s, as it were. And during this conference, they decided to, to talk about all their ideas so they could find out, you know, how they could all come together and, and have one understanding from the church. And one of the topics they started with was with uh, the Eucharist. And Zwingli was the first one to present and says, well, the Eucharist is a memorial of that historic event of the Last Supper that Jesus spent with his disciples. And so when we, when we take these symbols of the cup and the bread, uh, we should do this reverently in remembrance of what took place. And all the while he's talking, Luther goes from pink <laughs> to red <laughs> to deep purple. And he finally bangs on the table with his fist and says, you're killing the body of Christ. <laughs> and he made his women cry. His women left the conference. And Zwingli never would sign on to the document that, that came out of the Augsburg Conference, the Augsburg Confession. He wouldn't sign the document. Because uh, Luther made him cry. <laughs> but Luther was just that sort of person. He was a crass individual. When he was officially excommunicated by the Catholic Church, which did not come as a result again of the grand posting of the 95 Theses on the church floor, which was about as dramatic as a present day college lecturer announcing an upcoming debate. But it came after the debate itself, when Luther was forced into his solo positions by the gifted order Johann Eck, who said that, you know, why don't you uh, obey what the Pope says? Well, the Pope is not the final authority. Councils have been the final authority. He said, oh, councils are the final authority. Why can't they already tell him? Aren't you a supporter of Johann uh, of Jan Hus and of his a uh, translation of scripture into the vernacular against the dictates of a church council? Was the council correct in condemning Hus or not? Well, no, councils aren't the final authority. Scripture is the final authority. <laughs> so you see how he got backed quickly into a corner of being more radical than really where he wanted to be. But he didn't have a choice because if he was to if he was to agree with that, it was going to be to renounce everything he had thus far stated and to make himself an afterthought. And of all the things that Luther could count about himself, afterthought was not one of them. Luther saw himself for the time he was a child. His, oh, what many scholars believe, this invention of the story of Billy being struck by lightning, which, which brought him into the Augustine uh, monastery to become a monk. And most scholars think this is a George Washington and the cherry tree story, probably invented by Luther himself, you know, to give him some kind of credential, some kind of a uh, baggage, um, demonstrates the, the character that we're dealing with here. Luther was a classic egoist, and even Protestant scholars will admit that. It's not like something that we're just going to bash Luther here because we're Catholic. I don't do that. But I do tell the truth. The truth is that Luther was egotistical, and Luther also could be a very crass individual. Luther was the kind of person that if you put on you know, a dress that did not compliment you, and you said, how do I look? I'm saying, well, that's the most god-awful thing in the world. I don't know why anybody would put that on their body. <laughs> you know, and that's just the kind of individual that he was. And so when he was excommunicated by the Pope after his debate by Bull, he said, well, this Bull is really Bull. <laughs> and then he burned it. <laughs> In not so many terms. So, Luther created, again, this monster. Because what he didn't understand is he wasn't going to be the final authority. People were going to take his idea and run with it and say, well, yeah, it's scripture alone, and that means whatever I think scripture says, it does. And there's no centralized authority to say, no, 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 this and no farther. There's no boundaries. There's no parameters. It, it, it just declared an open season on Christian belief. We can start transforming this into anything we want. And that becomes problematic 
for Luther himself. Zwingli, uh, you know, Luther is still going to be practicing for all types of purposes Catholicism. He's going to reject the Pope. He's going to reject the councils. But you look at Luther's actual practices, he still believes himself in transubstantiation. He still upholds Marian doctrine. He still upholds Lent and, and, the, and the feasts and fasts of the church. He still upholds the communion of saints. None of these things have gone anywhere for Luther. He departs from celibate clergy, uh, and mostly that was very personal as well. He himself married a nun who left the church, so, so that had more of a personal flavor to it than it had of any real genuine theological conviction that, that uh, they shouldn't marry. But he basically came down and murdered most of the other day. Well, there's nothing in scripture saying that a pastor has to be unmarried, so, and since scripture is the final authority, then priests can marry. There's, there's no reason why priests can't marry. Well, that's the problem. If you start going with Scripture alone, if you're going to say Scripture alone, there better be a universal interpretation of that Scripture that affects all of Christianity. Or what have you got in your hands? you got real trouble. you got people say, I'm Christian. And you're like, well, you don't believe this. doesn't matter. I believe the Bible. And this is what the Holy Spirit told me the Bible says. Well, yeah, but I have the Holy Spirit too, and the Holy Spirit hasn't told me that. The, the Catholic Church had the Holy Spirit for 1,500 years before you. It didn't tell the Catholic Church that. So, is the Holy Spirit the author of confusion? Is he deliberately giving separate messages to ultimate communities? Or what do we have going on here? Or has somebody failed to really be listening to the Holy Spirit correctly? Have they, in fact, mistaken their own voice for that of the Spirit? But see, without a centralized authority in the church, you have no way of determining that whatsoever. And no way of stopping anyone else from what they want to do. If you want to say that uh, Jesus was actually an astronaut from the planet Kolob and, and he came down to teach us the peace of the galaxy and that's how I read scripture I can say why well, I, I disagree that's wrong I can even call you a cult I can say by all means stay away from that it's evil it's awful but, but, but what can I say at the end of the day well your interpretation is wrong because I don't really and I can say it but I don't have any standard by which to draw from and say that my interpretation is more valid than your interpretation. There's no standard. There's no history I can point to. The beauty of the Catholic Church, if you haven't realized it by now, is in its history. We have a history that goes all the way back to Jesus, Peter, the Apostles, that enables us to be able to say, we have the authority to say what we say. That authority comes from Christ through the apostles, through the bishops they appointed. Irenaeus said this as much in the second century, the year 180, he published a, a series of books that he called Against Heresies, and in book three, chapter three, section two, uh, he made a definitive statement that the authority of the church is the very ancient, the very universal, the very correct church of Rome. And any communities that want to call themselves Christian have to find themselves in agreement with this community. Now, this is really ironic. Why? Irenaeus doesn't come from the West. Irenaeus came from the East. He came with his mentor to Lyons. And in Lyon, he actually then was introduced to the West and became the Bishop of Lyon in, in secession. But what's interesting about that is, is that where would you expect somebody from the East to say the center of the church is? Constantinople. Constantine said you expect him to point to Constantine, not to Rome. But here is, here is Irenaeus in the second century. Well, he wouldn't actually be pointing to Constantine then, but he'd still be pointing to the East. But here he is in the second century pointing to the West. Pointing to Rome and saying, 
It didn't start here. It, the, the capital is not here in the east. The capital is in the west. He said that that church was founded. Now, again, you're 180 saying this. It was founded by the two preeminent apostles. By, no, I'm sorry, the two most glorious apostles, Peter and Paul. And he says that, therefore, this church has preeminent authority over all other churches and communities. Now, that's the second century. So that's the beauty of our faith, is we have this history. As we're going to find is, is that this thing, this entity, this jello on the wall that's going to be about as easy to nail down, known as Protestantism, does not have this history. What they have is the ideals of the humanistic enlightenment that they bring to bear into their understanding of theology. And again, to describe humanism again, it's the idea of the individual being raised above the community. The idea of the individual being his or her own authority. I made a, a meme on Facebook one, one point in time, maybe a little bit you know, antagonistic, but it does make the point. I showed a, a Protestant congregation, I said Protestantism, where every pastor is Pope, and every uh, parishioner is a scripture scholar. And, it, and it's true. You know that in Protestant churches, a lot of them, they don't really have to agree with their pastor. They can call their pastor to pass. They can have a council inside their own individual congregation that invites the pastor to leave. Because that's not how we interpret scripture. I used to see it that way. We don't. You know? Uh, as a matter of fact, I know a pastor personally who was dismissed from his congregation because he preached against uh, extramarital infidelity. And unbeknownst to him, the deacons of his church were in a ring that were having uh, waste swapping parties. <laughs> and guess what happened? The deacon body invited him to leave. Yeah. They were going to change what, what they felt. <laughs> They changed it to his venue. <laughs> okay, you're done now. You're fired. <laughs> but this happens. Okay? Do we have problems inside the Catholic Church? Of course we do. Okay? Anywhere there's human beings about. I'm not trying to present Catholicism as perfectly run, perfectly organized, you know what I'm saying? But again, what do we have that keeps us on track and on base? We have history. We have the succession. And we must never sacrifice that succession of the bishops on the desire, the altar, if you will, of wanting to get along. There's sins as Catholics that we don't sacrifice. Just because we want to be unoffensive in our apologetics doesn't mean we sacrifice truth on that pile. We don't, we, don't, we don't say, okay, yeah, well, well you're right. Mary, Mary uh, probably wasn't a virgin after she was married. No, we don't sacrifice those things. We say no. Uh, in factuality, this is why we can say from Scripture that Scripture itself, as well as everything else, backs up what the church has said throughout its history. And this is how the church can also speak to the Scripture, and how by bringing both tradition and Scripture together, we get a much more complete understanding than if we're going off of them. Well, the Bible says this to me. <laughs> because guess what? If you're really going to interpret the Bible well, if you're really going to declare that you understand what the Bible says, what should you have? What is necessary for that? Shouldn't you have an education in the Bible? Wouldn't you need to know the original languages of the Bible? And I don't mean just be able to do a little word study on a strong speed form or something. But I mean, actually know how the dynamics of the original language works. If you're going to claim to be a Bible scholar, wouldn't you have to be able to uh, know something of the background, of the period of time in which the Bible was written, the authors of the Bible, the audience it was written to, the place it was written from? Wouldn't you have to take all those things into account? Because what happens if you don't have an understanding of original Culture, 
original authorship of the Bible. What happens? You're going to drag your cultural understanding, your understanding of language, and worse than that, you're going to bring your reading of a translation of an original text into the text itself. Boy, have I heard some bad sermons in my time. And I can say that as one who has studied the Bible. And as one who, I'm by no means perfect, but by one who is in fact very responsible with how he's going to treat Scripture. I went out of my way to learn original language. I didn't have to. I wanted to. Because I thought, how am I ever going to be able to say I know what the Bible says if I don't know what it reads in Greek? If I don't have some understanding of how it reads in Hebrew, I, I can't get up. Be, when I was looking to come across the pastor, I thought, I can't get up in front of a congregation and say, well, I know, listen to me, because I know more about the Bible than you do. I better know more than the Bible than you do, if I'm going to be able to do that. So even as a Protestant, I took understanding Scripture very seriously. I know how seriously priests take understanding the Bible. And again, they got more help than, me, than I had. I had to go simply off of hermeneutical tools. They also have the magisterium of the church to help guide them and, and let them know that, okay, I can go here, but I can't go here. Because we inside the council, we don't have a direct teaching on every passage of scripture. It's got to be taught this way, this way, this way, this way. But what we do have is, we do have boundaries. You can go here and no further. You can go here, but not here. And that's what? For the preservation of belief, so that our belief itself, so our doctrine itself, does not change across the centuries. Our practice can change. Our practice can change without the duty to act, or how much practice changes. Our doctrine had better never change a single word. If our doctrine changes a single word, we have divorced ourselves from the Church of Christ and the Apostles. It's, it's basically that simple. It's plainly that simple. Does anybody here understand that? Yeah. Yeah. So in the wake of this breach, Zwing was back in a debate against a local bishop. In 1524, icons were removed from the Swiss churches. Fasting and clerical celibacy was abolished. And in 1525, the Latin Mass was replaced with a vernacular memorial service. Again, uh, Zwingli completely did away with the idea of a sacramental understanding of Eucharist. That was no longer the body and blood of Christ in it. That was now just a way of him thinking back, remembering, you know, fondly uh, what the Lord did with his disciples on his last night on earth. And that, by the way, is a complete misunderstanding of the Hebrew context of what Jesus said in Luke, which we would love to point to, when Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Here is exactly what I was talking about a couple of moments ago. Bring a 20, 20th, 21st, or as Wendy's Day, a 16th century understanding of the English language into the context of first century Judaic understanding. Okay? When we think of remembering something, what do we mean? We mean what we tie a string around our finger and we're going to remember it. Or if we have a Memorial Day, we're thinking back fondly on a historical event that happened, or maybe tragically on a historical event that happened. You know, now the most recent I'd say that we have is. Something